Now, as per the program, there was to be a discussion session, and that was from 6 to 6.30. We are now at 6.35. Uh, but I just chatted with Daniel a little bit separately. And so he's agreed kindly to start after 15 minutes from now, which is 6.50 Indian time. And uh, so we have 15 minutes. And during these 15 minutes, if anyone would like to ask a question from any of today's speakers who are present, uh, you're free to do that. I'm sorry, there isn't a, any kind of break, but that's the program. So, uh, yeah. So Sachin has a question. Sachin, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, my question is to for Loga. Is Loga around? Let me check. Loga. Yes. yes. Uh, Loga, in your last slide, you had a comment about uh, DS cosmology. Do, do you mean in the super versus sub horizon mode? Is that what you meant, or what exactly you meant in that comment? Um, yes, something like that. Yeah, and. Uh, yeah, uh, there's something that I'm, I'm thinking about, but I, but this is probably not the right uh, time or the place to talk about it. But if you you know, but we can talk about it separately. Yeah, but, okay. but the short answer is yes. Okay. Okay. Somebody was asking if Shiraz is around. I think Shiraz is around. Shiraz, would you confirm? Uh, yes, I'm here. He's around. So whoever it was, I think Aisar Bhopal had a question. Yeah. Uh, am I audible? Yes. 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 Okay. Shiraz, just one. Uh, confirmation so the theories that you talked about uh, today so that that is defined in any three dimensional manifold i mean one can compute those things in any three dimensional manifold well it's defined on any three dimensional manifold yes but computations are hard outside the sphere and the reason for this is uh, is as follows you see suppose you take pure chan simon's theory for instance on a torus mm. that that theory has a very large number of zero energy states okay the number of uh, the number of states grows like some high power of n so in some sense the entropy of that is like e to the pi n square okay. now uh, uh, this is like the dominant effect and then matter is a sub is uh, in the in the sense of the one over n expansion a subleading effect in that yes okay so uh, uh, <clears throat> doing the large n expansion of this theory is hard uh, because of, uh, of 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 these uh, very low energy states the sphere is great in that regard because uh, um, on the sphere, pure Chan Simon's theory is, is really trivial. There's only one single vacuum state. So matter gives you everything. And so the, the large N expansion is easy. So I don't think anyone's, you know, manage, uh, I think the theory is well defined in every, on every manifold and there are interesting things to compute, but it's hard to do. Actually, many years ago, there were these papers by Schenker and Shamik Banerjee and so on, where they tried to do some of they try to make some progress on looking at some questions with matter and uh, uh, higher genus manifolds. But it's a hard problem. Oh, 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 so I was basically just thinking about uh, for R2 cross S1 also, it should be very hard. R2 cross, cross S1 is fine. Oh, uh, okay. Of course, you have to define R2. So one way of defining it is as the large radius limit of S2. And then That's it's fine. Yeah, that is what I would, uh, I mean, so so let me ask this question like this. My interest was uh, to use uh, your formulation to, to say something about uh, flat space uh, holography, okay? So so for flat space scenario, this Chan Simons uh, actually appear with a non-compact gauge group, which is ISO 2,1. The corresponding Chan Simon gauge group is ISO 2,1, and it is defined on uh, R2 cross uh, S1. So I was just thinking that if uh, so, if a partition function for the same is anyway uh, one can compute even in presence of some matter field, if that helps, then uh, probably one should be able to say something for the corresponding uh, dual theory. I mean, uh, so you you were there in Tadashi's talk, right? So yes, I was in Tadashi. Tadashi was doing it for uh, DS three and the corresponding um, field theory. Uh, and he actually needed a Chan Simon with with, with SU2 gauge field, but he was doing it probably on R3 uh, or maybe on S3. S3, yeah. So I, I was just so so, so a, a parallel for for flat space case is not known. I mean, well, let me make one little comment about this. You know, the problem with flat space is that it has it, that space time has a boundary. Okay, so for instance, you can think yes. of scry plus and scry, mi scry minus as the boundary of space. Yes, yes. Now, when you put Chun Simons on a theory with a boundary, you 
typically get boundary balls. The Skyro yes. Vesumino Witten model that yes. Yes. Nati and friends worked out so many years ago. Uh, and uh, uh, I mean, wait, if you really honestly want to do something in a in non compact space without thinking of it as a limit of a large compact space, I suspect you have to deal. You have to think carefully about those boundary modes. But yeah, in the, in this case, it's only those boundary modes which are non trivial because there is nothing in the bar. without the matter. Yes, yes, without the matter. Yes. Yeah. Uh, right. So, so you were saying that those computations are uh, like not not known right well i think if you were really interested in a pure chance i i haven't thought about your iso whatever theory but if you were just in su2 john simon's theory that would just give probably just give you these chiral where we know what it was on the board the iso2 comma one will also i mean that also has a where we know which in counterpart but it's just that the partition function for that I mean, one can construct the theory, and that would be like a chiral Vesuvian theory with ISO two comma one as its gauge group. But the corresponding computations for the partition functions probably are uh, yeah. I mean, I was just trying to ask you if that is anywhere known, or if you think that is doable. But you're you're really interested in the pure chance Simon theory, is that is this right? Uh, pure chance Simon would I I think in this context pure chance Simon would be the simplest one but like if having some matter helps in the calculation that's fine hmm. Hmm. okay I just wonder if there are some issues having to do with the fact that the gauge group is non non compact yeah yeah I, yeah I think that this uh, I, but I haven't thought I haven't thought thought hard about it but but let me say one more thing just in the context of matter chance Simon series there is a hint that these boundary modes cause trouble oh not trouble they cause interesting physics hmm. and the hint for this statement is that if you compute s matrices in these theories s matrices of the matter hmm. you find funny properties you find that these s matrices do not appear to simultaneously obey uh, simultaneously obey both unitarity and crossing hmm. sort of define an s matrix that looks unitary but then seems to violate crossing and i think that this is uh, uh, this is a sign that uh, when you when you want want to deal with the, really this infinite flat space, you need to carefully deal with this boundary modes that has not ever care and, in, and their interplay with the matter. I think this is not ever really carefully been done. I'm not sure it's related to your question, but just to say. Okay, thank you, Sharon. Okay, ICTS AV team has a question. I assume that's the seminar room there. Huh? Yes. Hello. Hi. Also, Tarnava, like, uh, is yes, yes. I wonder, Sorry. you can hear me, right? Yeah, please. Uh, in with breaks, yeah, yeah. So, my question was like, uh, in this group from TFR relates this uh, maximal chaos kind of uh, property to the growth of some scattering amplitude, right? So, uh, is there a similar statement you could make about from the pole skipping perspective, like? So, uh, there's a recent paper by Natsumi. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I mean, I have not uh, read that completely, but uh, yeah. I mean, you can look into that paper uh, just, uh, I think, 10 days ago. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, maybe I can take the opportunity to ask a question to Shiraz since I still see him here. Uh, Shiraz, you had, uh, I came in, a, unfortunately, a little late to your talk, but I, I read the slides later. And uh, somewhere you uh, actually made a conjecture about properties of integrable representations of esumino written models, which as uh, which uh, roughly, I mean, or which simply can be stated that if there are two representations, one and two, that appear when I tensor a bunch of uh, what uh, sequentially fused representations together, then the number of times one appears over two is the ratio of their quantum dimensions, right? Correct. And uh, but so just trying to understand that formula. So in this number you're talking of is the number of times a given representation arises by tensoring what representation with itself. It, any, it doesn't matter any uh, any sufficiently large number of representations. Uh, any any representation, but with itself sufficiently not necessarily large. itself. Any oh. sufficiently large number of representations. Oh, any sufficiently large number of representations. Maybe, maybe I can put this conjecture in context. Yeah, yeah. Please do. Okay, it. let's first do classical group theory. Okay, so now suppose I tensor. Uh, I've got representations R one, R two, up to R n, 
Okay, I keep my group, let's say S U N fixed. So these are two different ends. So R one, R two, up to R M. Mm -hmm. I keep my group S U N fixed. N is fixed, and I take M to infinity. Okay. Now I want I, what I want to know is in the product of all these representations, how many copies of some other representation? Let's say some R P appear. Okay. So I can get that by by taking the complex conjugate of the character of R P. Okay, mm -hmm. multiplying it with the character with the product of characters of all the representations I have, and integrating over over the unitary group using the Weyl integral formula. Okay, but now since these there, there are so many represent representations inserted, uh, the integral uh, you've got a uh, you've got a parameter in your problem, and the integral is going to be localized on the the unitary matrix that maximizes the mm -hmm. integral. Mm -hmm. But in classical group theory, that's very simple because there is one element, namely identity, on which all all characters are as large as they can be. Right? There's the obvious inequality that chi r of identity modulus mm -hmm. is greater than or equal to chi r of any u. Mm -hmm. Okay, because so the, the dimension of the representation. Just the dimension, yeah. the classical dimension of the representation. Classical dimension. Yeah. Okay, so uh, in this case, as you as you just pointed out, the the you, we've got the sequence of, of of representations, and then we add another one, and uh, uh, the dependence on which one you added comes just through chi evaluated on identity of that representation, and therefore it's classical dimension. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in classical group theory, what I said is sort of obviously true. Mm -hmm. Okay, now uh, our conjecture is that uh, th there is a quantum analog, the quantum group analog of the statement. Um, and that it's actually a slightly more precise statement then. Uh, and that when that when you do the same thing, you get uh, the quantum dimension rather than the classical dimension of the op of the operator. Okay. And one last remark about this. Uh, this is something we've not proved, but we've got a fair amount, a re reasonable amount of evidence for, I think. Okay. And uh, w w one last thing about that is this. Um, you know, unlike in the classical case where you have to integrate over um, over all unitary matrices with the hard measure. In this, um, in the Verlinde formula, you need to sum over discrete, over a finite set of discrete eigenvalues. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, uh, the Verlinde formula establishes a map between these discrete eigenvalues and, and integrable representations of, um, uh, of the bessemer witten theory. And there is one, of course, very distinguished in integrable representation, namely the identity representation. Okay, and that representation maps to a non-trivial configuration of eigenvalues, because you know the identity of as a unitary matrix is not an allowed ident uh, eigenvalue configuration, because mm -hmm. the rules are that, for instance, you have to be a, a an a kappa at root of unity, but all eigenvalues have to be different. Different, right? Okay, so the identity maps in some sense to the representations that that's as close as you can get to the identity matrix. Mm -hmm. Staying within the set, okay. And our conjecture is that uh, 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 that this that in that sum over the Belinde thing. So now the integral over U is replaced now by a sum over these these discrete number of eigenvalues. Mm -hmm. So the same reason that the saddle point dominated in the integral over U in the classical problem, the sum here will be dominated by one term. Mm -hmm. It will be the term that that maximizes the characters. And effectively, our conjecture is that. Th the character of every integrable representation, modulus of the character of every integrable representation, is largest on this special eigenvalue configuration, namely the one dual to the identity representation. But and, since we know, since we know these characters explicitly for uh, we know written models, right? So they're just the Katz file formula. Yeah, it's so actually even simpler. The character, but I'm when, when, uh, the character I'm talking about is the classical group theory character. Just, just okay. It's like you know the for SU two, it's the sign by sign. It's mm -hmm. not the character of the West Minoid. It's okay, just okay. character of the, the group. Okay. Sorry, either I froze or you froze. Yeah, sorry, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah I can hear you. Okay, so for, for instance, if you are making this conjecture for SU2, hmm. it's just a simple conjecture about a function. I see. Okay, uh, and for SU2, we're pretty sure this is right because uh, we've checked it on Mathematica mm -hmm. all over the place. Okay. Okay. But yeah, I, 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 somebody more ma somebody more mathematically powerful than me would be able to prove it. I think. Okay. Yeah. Okay, we have. Uh, let's move on. We have two more minutes. Sachin has his hand raised. Maybe that yeah. would be the last question, and then we should really stop. 
Okay. Uh, so I have a question for Traksu. Trak, Traksu. Uh, sorry. So is it Traksu? Yes. 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 Uh, yeah, so you know, uh, there was this recently a paper by in D Sitter space. Uh, you know, given a flat space amplitude, uh, there was a unique way to you know, for example, uh, a simple way to flip it to the uh, D Sitter amplitude. Let's say for three point function or also four point function with a particular exchange. Okay, okay. and uh, of course, uh, you know, it, uh, so. Um, uh, so the kind of formula that you showed uh, is that is that what you have showed that given a flat space amplitude, I just I have some differential operator, I differentiate and I I, I just get the uh, anti dissipator amplitudes. Uh, yeah, not exactly because given a flat space amplitude, uh, you can uh, have uh, you can go to different uh, like in the uh, in the uh, ADS limit ADS uh, you can have different corrections in one over R. Because because uh, the derivatives don't commute, right? Uh, I mean the uh, the the covariant derivatives do not commute. So in general, you can have different expression in uh, corrections in one over r given the flat space asymmetrics. So uh, but but still uh, still you can get uh, some information. Uh, like, uh, does it uh, answer your question? I see. Uh, okay. Uh, maybe maybe I'll, I'll ask you later. Yeah, we, we will we'll discuss often. Okay. Thank you all. So I think this concludes today's discussion session. And uh, in principle, we have no uh, break, but um, uh, oh, there was a question for Zohar. I'm sorry. Chetan had a question for Zohar. Chetan, go ahead quickly. Uh, yeah, I just, uh, it's basically just the question that I have I've written there. It's just that I was wondering if... Uh, oh, yeah, so uh, I was just asking if, uh, you know, if you... It seems like uh, if you're, for instance, I mean, I was thinking of like analogy with this in some sense in D7 or D8 brains or something, it seems like you might have, you might back react too much or something like that. So I was just wondering if this is uh, really tied to CFTs or not. Yeah, this is a very good question. So the question is whether uh, these flows on the line defect can destroy the bulk in some sense, right? Yeah, that's so, right. Right, so the example, for instance, with the free field uh, in three dimensions, you could interpret it in, the, in this way because the instability that's caused by uh, adding a linear term on the line somehow leads to some instability in the bulk. That's why it goes to minus infinity. More generally, uh, I think this, I, I think more generally, it's only possible in free field theory. That's my uh, understanding that uh, only in free field theory, there could be some um, uh, logarithms uh, that would uh, uh, back, react, back react on the bulk too much. I do not believe it's possible for uh, interacting bulk CFTs, but I may be wrong. That's my understanding. Thank you. Okay. I can say, I can say okay. Uh, I can write in the chat why I think that this is true. I'll write in the chat. Yeah, I mean, I yeah. asked the question right as he was closing the thing, so it's okay. I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll you. write in the chat why I believe it's true. Thank you. Yeah, I think we really have no more time, and uh, you know, it's uh, if Daniel starts immediately, which he's going to do, uh, it'll still be much beyond eight by the time we end with questions and so on. Eight Indian time. So I really. Think